As we've witnessed recently with the Jack Eichel situation, team management, especially ownership, can be crucial to a player's success and general well-being. Because we all know hockey is a team sport. Therefore, despite having some great players on their rosters, there have been some instances going back to last decade that team management has created a literal dumpster fire on ice. In this video, we're going to go over a few great players that have at one point in time played for poorly managed teams. And with that, here are three great NHL players that have played for terribly managed teams. So before Eric Carlson jumped ship, following, you know, the Mike Hoffman rift um, from one bad situation to another, he was a franchise star for the Ottawa Senators, a defenseman that could easily blow a spectator away with his smooth skating finesse and his ability to join in on the rush with ease. As during his time with the Senators, number 65 was able to capture the Norris on two separate occasions, the second of which included his remarkable point per game season after playing 82 games. Ottawa's captain, as he finished with 82 total points, it was the first time a defenseman finished in the top five in scoring in 30 years, as Paul Coffey did so during the 1985-86 season. Therefore, I think we can all agree that in his prime, Eric Carlson was among the best on the back end. But the villain of this story, well, <laughs> outside of the locker room anyways, was Senator's owner Eugene Melnick. As Melnick, during Carlson's tenure with Ottawa, created a very toxic environment culturally when he wasn't in court for fraud, that is, just to go over a few things Melnick did while Carlson was the face of his team here. Okay, aside from starting to blow up the team right after they were a goal away from the Stanley Cup Finals, on the eve before, you know, what was supposed to be an enjoyable celebration of the team and, and their history, as in the Heritage Classic, Melnick decided for whatever reason to get extremely controversial upon an interview after being asked about the team's future by saying, if it doesn't look good here, it could look good somewhere else, Melnick says. But I'm not suggesting that right now. That's always a possibility with any franchise. I won't sell it. It just won't happen. Imagine if you own a McDonald's franchise but you can move it. Why would you sell it? It's something that's very difficult to buy. We're doing okay here. We're not doing great, but I'm not going to blow a lifetime of working hard to support a hockey team. It's not going to happen. And yeah. And went on to talk about basically uh, how these players are overpaid by saying, we spend 68 million a year. And like everyone says, are you cheap? Are you kidding me? Even at 68 million, that's way too much over a revenue base that we have. And then went on to offer his franchise star an eight year contract with an AV of uh, 10 million. And this was after LA Kings defenseman Drew Doughty had just inked his fresh eight year deal worth 88 million. Sure, Doughty did have cup pedigree at that point, but if I'm Eric Carlson and I've won two Norris trophies and you know helped get uh, your team to the Eastern Conference Conference finals for the first time in a decade, uh, it would naturally feel like a slap in the face. Anyways, it's no wonder former captain Daniel Alfredson was quoted saying, we hope we get a new owner. So this one is definitely more GM focused uh, more than anything, but then again, I honestly don't know what's worse, an owner that enables Peter Shirelli for years or Peter Shirelli just being Peter Shirelli. Anyways, in walks generational talent Connor McDavid, drafted just in time to meet the freshly hired man that would go on to ruin his team for season upon season. Unlike Eugene Melnick though, the problem wasn't really toxicity, but rather just straight up incompetence. I mean, when you have the opportunity to draft Connor McDavid, you're going to want to put a solid core around him, or at least um, keep the parts that are assembled and working. So what does Shirelli decide to do? Decides to trade away Jordan Eberle, who, you know, literally just came off a 50.20 goal season, who was, you know, one of the team's top three scorers for Ryan Strome. No disrespect, but this was not the best move for anyone. Not even Strome, who was dealt out East before, you know, he could even play a second season for Edmonton. And then there's a whole Taylor Hall trade. Yes, he legitimately traded away a guy that scored 26 goals for the team on three different occasions for Adam Larson. Anyways, Hall definitely stuck it to him with that heart trophy the next season, am I right? And yeah, for whatever reason, Shirelli decided it was a good idea to give Milan Lucic the exact same contract and value that he did for Hall. You know, the seven year, $42 million kind. Before Shirelli gave his ultimate farewell though, he made a move that internally, Edmonton's captain probably didn't appreciate. You know, trading for the player and Brandon Manning that admitted to McDavid that he intentionally tried to injure him. 
we can put the hole if he did it to, on purpose thing to rest because you know, what he said out there kind of confirmed that. We all know McDavid is far from the type that would speak out against the move, but I feel like any human being would feel kind of disrespected. So yeah, one trip to the postseason for McDavid under Shirelli, largely due to his incompetency and carelessness. But for McDavid, thankfully, things have changed and Edmonton is yet again postseason bound. Yes, here we are. are talking again about the Eiffel Tower, but in case you weren't able to catch my last video on the subject, this one is definitely going to be more detailed and focus in more on the terrible ownership in Buffalo. So you probably are aware of who Cam and Terry Pagula are. I mean, unfortunately, when owners are so bad at their jobs, well, word gets around fast in the hockey community. So February of 2011, Terry Pagula buys the Sabres. I guess technically they made the playoffs in the Pagula era like one time, but unfortunately they lost in the first round. Anyways, it's pretty evident looking back that, well, as soon as the Pagulas showed up, the organization literally plummeted into the abyss. But you know, part of the downward spiral of mediocrity allowed for the team to draft the 2015 second overall pick in Jack Eichel. Sure, the last second overall pick the Sabres received the year prior in Sam Reinhart has been a great core piece for them, but I mean, to be the second player to win the Hobie Baker Award ever as a freshman to an owner speaks, here's a great player, don't mess this up. But as most of us know, that is exactly what they've done. Aside from being notorious for appointing all of the wrong people beneath them, such as you know, Jason Botterill, the guy that Kim Pagula falsely said was coming back while stating, quote, we have a bit more information than fans, yeah. But unfortunately, that was a lie, and he was fired three weeks later. To put it into perspective, during Eichel's time as a Sabre, the team has had three GMs in roughly six years, while teams such as Nashville, Vancouver, Chicago, etc., etc., have only had one. They've had four head coaches, including Granado. The instability paired with the incompetence up top has weighed on Eichel so much that he felt he needed to call them out, essentially, while saying there was a, quote, disconnect between him and the franchise during a season and exit interview, while indicating that management isn't listening to him about what needs to be done about his injury and not trusting that he knows his own body. So nothing but a sad stint of mediocrity for Eichel. Despite all of his talents, they've just been wasted essentially during his time thus far in the league. 